Okay, uh, my name is Jeff Hemenoy. I'm the soil health specialist with NRCS, and I'm actually going to do a, a rainfall simulation. But one of the first things I like to do before I even get started is is take the mystery out of the rainfall simulation. I'd really like to do that by doing what? Well, passing out some samples. And I always like to do samples, and uh, it's 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 okay. I do catch and release on soils, so you can take a sample and and if you want to look at you look at that sample and compare it to that one. Do you see any differences here between between these soils? Any differences at all? It kind of passes around. But the, the point I'm really trying to make here today is that, that these are the same soil. In fact, you'll see this later on the tour, right across from each other. The first soil that I gave that has this, this definite structure, etc., is a stacked rotation. Uh, corn, corn, bean, bean, wheat, wheat. Uh, lots of residue, etc. The other one is a continuous corn from across the road. And at some point, you look at that soil structure and you go, boy, they, they do look somewhat different. What about, you know, you see the macropores over here, you see that pore structure. You don't see that in that tilled sample. And how does that, uh, how does that, that uh, function, how does that, how does that change that function? How does that change the hydrology? It has to do with that biological integrity. And we're gonna be talking a lot about that here today. At some point, you need to realize that soils function with soil biology. That life within that soil is critical. And we need to be able to feed that within that system. We need to be able to maintain it. And there's a number of things that we actually do within soils that are going to degrade that. In other words, if we don't feed that system, if you don't have diversity within that system, if you do tillage, uh, we can talk about earthworms. If you want to kill earthworms, you do tillage. Why? It's really simple. You go through with the tillage tool, you destroy their home and them, and you reduce numbers as much as 90%. So with a tilled system, we're going to reduce those organisms that create what? Macropores, et cetera, within that system. What does that have to do with the hydrology? If we reduce hydrology and we increase runoff on those sites, what happens? At some point, you end up with less biomass. In other words, less production on that field. Also, you end up with a degraded site such that at the bottom of the hill, you'd say, well, gee, we go further east. We have a lot of people say, well, I need to tile my land. Do you really need to tile your land, or do you need to change management so that when that raindrop hits that soil, it actually moves into the soil profile instead of runs off? Those are some changes we really need to make. Now, at some point, we also need to be talking about some other things today, and I brought some samples with, these samples. And this is our slate test, and what I'm going to do is, is that stacked rotation is immerse this quad, and one of the first things you're going to actually see is that as I immerse that quad, there's air, in other words, you see the bubbles coming out, etc. There's air in soils. In other words, it's about half pore space. All right. So that pore space either is made up of water and or air. And at some point, the integrity or in other words, how whole, how, how that sample is actually held together really has to do with the function of that biology, that rotational system that we've implemented. In addition to that, that conventional tilled over here, if you look at how it, see the bubbles coming out again, how the, that, that structural integrity um, um, is, is put together within that sample. In other words, do we have that, those uh, 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 polysaccharides or those uh, uh, glycoproteins that, that hold that sand, silt, and clay together? If they're not present, what happens? It degrades very rapidly, and as it degrades very rapidly, what do we end up with? A plugged soil surface, we end up with increased uh, runoff, decreased infiltration on that particular site, changing that hydrology again. The biology has a lot to do with the hydrology. Hydrology has a lot to do with biology. They're interrelated. That plant community is absolutely necessary. You gotta get it right to end up with something that's going to be what? Functioning within that soil profile. Now, I really like doing this test because it's, it's pretty visual. You can see how that, that soil sample actually breaks down if it doesn't have that um, the, that cohesion for that aggregate stability within that system. Now, as I go through this and talk some more about this, we'll be looking at, at later today, we'll be talking more about soil profile, but it impacts that whole soil profile, and that whole system, and you can see that over time within the profile. Um, with that, I'm going to actually turn on the rainfall simulator over here, but before I do that, I'm going to explain a little bit how this works. Uh, some people here in the, in the audience have probably already seen this before. But today I've run a couple other samples today. These are samples um, primarily from here, in other words, off the station. So what we've done is, is looked at um, differences in management and we'll explain that first. Um, let's talk about the rainfall simulator. 
Rainfall simulator uh, basically is set up to put on about an inch and a half uh, of water in the next 10, 15 minutes. All right. Actually designed by uh, Dr. Paul Yassa down at the University of Nebraska probably in the early 90s, 91, 92, something like that. So when we get questions about the rainfall simulator, I say, you know, he still works for the University of Nebraska. You can call him. It's a pretty easy thing to do. And at, at some point, um, that functionality is really designed to, to really simulate that rainfall event. Inch and a half of water, if it hits the soil surface, what happens? Well, it either goes into the soil, in other words, we call that infiltration, or it moves off, and we call that runoff. And runoff actually in the rainfall simulator will actually go, um, once it hits the, the flat, if it does run off, it goes through this front funnel and it will end up in the front jar. Each one of the samples, same thing happens. If it goes through the, that pan, it ends up being caught by a catchment pan underneath, and that catchment pan directs all that infiltrated water into the back set of jars. Pretty straightforward. In other words, runoff goes in the front set of jars, infiltrated water goes into the back. All right, the samples. Okay, you'll see these on the tour today. Um, this again is conventional till from across the road. Um, here is a really simple corn bean rotation right across the, the uh, um, alleyway from each other. Uh, corn bean rotation, um, simplified rotational system. You can see the corn residue on the surface. The other one we have here is, as I have that clod over there, that's that stacked rotation, corn, corn, bean, bean, wheat, wheat. Of course, there's corn on it this year. We've got wheat residue on the soil surface. This is a sample that I just brought with. Uh, we really want to talk about live root systems, so I put in a cover crop uh, sample within in the, the run. And we need to talk about perennials as being very beneficial within our rotational systems. This is a switchgrass sample that's pulled right here. So perennials, cover crop, Stacked rotational system, diversity, eh, not diverse at all. Some of us would even question whether that's really a rotation, and then non-rotational conventional tilled system. Okay, uh, let's turn it on and see what happens here. One of the first things I guess I really like to talk about on, on, on systems is, is that when we look at conventionally tilled systems, what's going to actually happen to that soil if we allow that kinetic energy to actually hit the soil surface? Well, a rainfall event has a lot of energy in it, and if it hits the, hits the uh, soil surface, that kinetic energy is exerted on the soil surface and does what? Well, it goes through a process of what we call detachment. In other words, you see that that soil actually um, is detached. It bounces up the air. At some point, having a lot of energy, um, you can see that, that uh, many times blown up over here, we've got a raindrop hitting the soil surface. And if you go through that detachment process and then end up with um, runoff starting to occur, we call that transport, that detachment and transport process we know as water erosion. That water erosion, um, is a degrading soil process. We absolutely do not want that to happen within our systems. We want to build soils. Um, and if that actually is occurring, then of course, um, we've already made one step back and we want to try to move forward in building uh, healthy soils. Now you can actually see that detachment actually occurring here. And if you've got any kind of residue on the soil surface, you see that, that we don't end up with that detachment, but you can see that, that soil splash on the backboard here actually starting to occur. And as I was just explaining this process, you could actually see that if you allow that kinetic energy to hit the soil surface and do not have either residue or a growing canopy in between to absorb that energy, what happens? The process unfolds. Almost immediately, it starts to occur. And you can see that happening within that conventionally tilled system. What I didn't tell you also is what also happens is beside the erosion process is that detachment is occurring, but we also have a reorientation of those soil particles on that soil surface. You can only imagine that we have uh, 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 pores within the matrix and macropores um, on that soil surface, and if you end up with soil movement and reorientation on the soil surface, it does what? It plugs those macropores. And if it plugs those macropores, then we end up doing what? 
increasing runoff and decreasing infiltration, something that we don't want to have occur. Again, getting back to how does that soil function, some real basics on how that actually works. I handed out those soil samples before, you just got to look at some of those. I want you to do that as you continue to go on the tour today, as you go home, you go out in the field, pick up that clod, look at that soil. Do I have macropores developed? If I don't, if I don't have that granular structure, I don't have those macropores developed, what do I need to do to get to that point? I need to change something within that system. It happens not only on agronomic systems, but it happens on our uh, grazing systems also. We can degrade those soils just because they have grass on them does not mean that they function the way they're supposed to, that they're managed the way they're supposed to, okay? You know, I talked a minute ago about a little bit more about that soil function, but, but you know, when we really start talking about that soil biology, you know, we, we don't know as <laughs> very much at all. And in fact, it, it always amazes me when I, I go over and talk to the microbiologists, I, I say, well, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, Dr. Lehman over here at ARS, we, we, we really started talking about mycorrhizal fungi, and they have what we, they call operational taxonomic units, in other words, basically the species of mycorrhizal fungi. And you, you go, well, what are the good guys, and at least you know, within the, the mycorrhizal fungi? And he can kind of really tell you a little bit more about that. A lot of the other organisms, we still don't know a great deal about. We don't know uh, as much as we could or should about the soils that, that we manage every day. And at some point, do we know that some of those microorganisms, are, they function better? Do we know that, that some of them are, well, not very functional, and yet they're very prevalent within some of our agronomic systems? Yeah. Um, how do we increase those guys? Well, we know that certain crops within rotational systems, oats as an example, will give you more diversity within that, that mycorrhizal fungi. So at, at some point, we do understand a little bit more about what we think we do as far as um, um, biology, but it's at some point, we really need to gain a lot more um, knowledge, uh, whether it, it be within the agency I work for or other land-grant universities. For the longest time, we've looked at chemical and physical properties of soils and really basically ignored uh, biological function uh, we're starting to, to, to learn a little bit more about that, and we really need to pay attention to that. Um, within soils, you know, I talked a minute ago about it being half pore space, but I want to talk just a minute more a little bit about that organic matter. At some point, we understand that a lot of that organic matter is stable. There's some of it that, that's readily decomposable. At, at some point, that's really what, the, what I call the holy grail. We're trying to get some soil tests that, that functionally give us a measure of that. But what I wanted to point out today, more than just about anything else, is at some point we need to realize of that organic matter portion of our soils, three to nine percent of that is actually living material. That can be a phenomenal difference, especially if we get into systems where we've degraded the amount of organic matter. Give you an example. If we plowed up the prairie, we know that we've lost 40 to 60 percent of that organic matter. I've lost 40 percent to 60 percent of that organic matter. But I've lost more than that of these guys, the live living biomass, right? Within our mollusks, we know that we've lost that, not just within the plow layer, but we've lost that organic matter deep within that profile. So it's not just the two million pounds on that acre furrow slice that we're talking about. We're talking about lower in that profile also. This can be phenomenal. This is tons of organisms that we've degraded out there on that landscape. At some point, we need to keep in mind that if that's really the case, why do we see on native rain sites that we don't need to have additional nitrogen fertilization? Because that system functions on its own. We've not degraded that within that native system. And if we can get to the point where we can do that on our agronomic systems, boy, what a gain that we're gonna actually make. Uh, Ray's gonna talk some more about that later today and I'm gonna turn this thing off and we're gonna look at some samples. Does management make a difference? Those of you that were listening to me probably learned less than those of you that were really paying attention to this. And what I want you to do is really look at this today, okay? Conventionally tilled system, the runoff. Infiltration, very little. And we'll see that some of that's probably prefer uh, preferential flow. Not as diverse a rotational system, Look at the amount of infiltrated water back here. Comparative runoff is 
Well, maybe a little bit less with this one. But look at what we have a live root system. What happens? Perennials within that system. Is that going to make a difference on function? Absolutely. Look at the amount of infiltrated water. Unbelievable differences. Okay? Of course, I'm a soils guy, so I like to, to flip things over and look at what we've got going on underneath and talk a little bit more about this because you know, at some point, I really believe that, you know, we talk about granular structure and people need to maintain granular structure, but for, in essence, in a lot of our agronomic systems, especially in tilled systems, producers, you know, they walk out and say, well, I've got good granular structure. It's subangular, blocky, massive, and or platy structure is what they have. They don't have granular structure. And you need to have perennials, you need to have that adversity within that system to get that structure. Okay, here's my diverse no-till rotational system. And by the way, I did put on about uh, a little more than I had wanted. It was, it was about an inch and three quarters, something like that. But let's just look at the soil profile that we have in the pan that we collected the other day and see what it looks like. And it looks like what you would really, really expect to see, at least from my standpoint, we, 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 what we see is that what I call that really black cottage cheese, that, that granular structure. Um, this is what we really want to see in that profile, right? Under conventionally tilled systems, you see this on the surface? How that surface is degraded because of that, that poor aggregate stability? You can see that, why did it run off? Well, it degraded, sealed over, and took off. Really straightforward, really simple, okay? Why is it dry on the bottom? It didn't infiltrate, it ran off. These soils are still loams. They should have about two inches per foot water holding capacity. I put on an inch and a half. This flat is only two inches deep. It should infiltrate water. If it doesn't infiltrate, water runs off. Is that going to impact production? Absolutely. Pretty straightforward. Huge differences in the amount of runoff. Huge. What also goes with that system? All my soil, sediment, any ag protection products I put on, et cetera, leave. That's an economic loss to producer. Also, it's a what? Water quality issue. So this is a win-win for the public and that producer if we can stop that from occurring. Here's my perennial. This is that switchgrass we collected yesterday. If you really want to see what granular structure is supposed to look like, look at that in that perennial system. That's what it's supposed to look like. If you want to have infiltration, if you want to have function within your soils, pull out a sample and look at that soil structure. Does it have macrophores? Is that good granular structure? If it's not there, you're doing something wrong within the system, you need to change something so that you end up with that system so that it functions. Um, as we go to the field, and we'll be going to the field in a few minutes here, we're going to be looking at something that, that this is a, as a demonstration that we, we take out eye pull samples all the time for folks. Um, at, at some point, we need to recognize not only the differences, but how are you going to measure that in the field? And we're going to go out on that, that uh, rain site and we're going to use an infiltration ring. And I've got some kits here. If you're interested in doing this, when you get back, you want a kit to take home, try this on your own monitor. I've got a number of those with today. But at some point, how do I end up measuring that um, on my own place? Well, the infiltration uh, ring is really simple to use. We drive that three inches into the soil. Um, we put in a piece of sulfane, put on an inch of water, Pull out the cellophane, measure the time it takes to infiltrate. If you're going to monitor site, you do that consistently over time. We're kind of getting what I'd call on the outside window of that opportunity right now. 
In other words, I like to do that when I have actively growing crops early in the season. If I'm doing this on any tilled system, it's once I get that crop established and growing, um, I don't want to have that confounded with uh, the issues of, of tilled, uh, loose um, systems. In other words, it needs to be settled back down again. But at some point, this is a way to do that. Um, I've got some fact sheets to go along with it. Within each one of these kits, there's a set of instructions and what you need to do uh, the analysis at least a couple of times. And at some point, if you need more rings, etc., give me a holler. Um, I always like doing this demonstration. I think that it, it uh, hopefully makes an impact on not only how you think about soils, but how you're going to measure success in the future um, in your systems. We've got a lot of people doing no-till systems now in South Dakota. Are they diverse enough? A lot of them are not. Do we see problems with soil structure and infiltration within those systems? We do. Do we need to change those or tweak those systems? Yes, we do. But we need to realize that by looking at field infiltrations. Okay, I think I'm done here for right now. And what we need to do is go over to the rain site um, and look at the profiles over there.